Welcome to A Journey Through the Message. My name is Robert. And my name is Heidi. And we are iced in today. Man, we just can't escape this ice storm and weather events out here. This one is kind of no joke. It's pretty impressive. What surprised me the most was how quickly it happened. It was crazy. And right on the button, they nailed it time-wise for start today. We bought a generator when we first moved into this house because we live kind of out in the country. And when we bought that generator, we had already lost power a couple times. For multiple days. Multiple days, two, three day events. And I was like, all right, enough of the crazy business. We're getting a generator. I have to let you know, we have a well. So when we lose power, we have no, we don't even have running water. We right, have no right. heat and no running water. I can't go very long before I get a little testy. Right. Right. Yeah, because uh, no running water means no coffee. And this woman right here, she needs her coffee. <laughs> I'm more concerned with um, other things. Bathing? Yes. Oh. <laughs> and going to the bathroom. Anyway. Ooh, so, did we say but, that out loud? <laughs> but here's the crazy thing. like we, So we bought the house you know, a year and a half or whatever ago. After those couple events, we have not had to use the generator since then so we've honestly never had a chance to plug in the generator because what he didn't mention is we didn't have the generator during those outages we oh, went yeah. through two of them and said that's it we're getting a generator yep, enough is enough and now we had to wait over a year because our power hasn't gone out doesn't that figure but i've been thankful i've been thankful too and i this is a good lesson in preparedness because i walk out i had the generator i didn't even check the level on the gas <laughs> <laughs> and I get it out there. I plug everything in. It's literally uh, raining ice down on me. It's so impressive. I'm, I'm done out there. I get everything plugged in and I turn on the generator. The power works and we're in the house. Everything is going great. It's amazing. I'm excited. And it lasts for about 45 minutes. Maybe 45 minutes. And all of a sudden and you hear the sp <laughs> the, that sputtering sound. <laughs> 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 And then it just died. And then gone. Sorry yeah. about that generator sound. That was kind of what it did. So luckily, we have a neighbor, and this is why it pays to be a good neighbor. I mean, if you have a neighbor, just be good to that person. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, get to know them a little bit. Our neighbor just saved me from having to go out in the ice. He has a tank sitting outside of one of his barns. He has some gas that he bought, I don't know, probably two years ago. <laughs> But he was there in that moment, and what a blessing. I mean, really, truly, what a blessing. Saved me from having to go out on the roads. Not safe to be out there right no, now. it wasn't even safe going down our driveway. <laughs> no. My car our would have not is, made it. Yeah, our, our driveway is not what you're thinking. When we say driveway, like, it's a third of a mile to the road. And it's all sandy, and there's yeah, ruts, and there's, paved. like, little water things. Like, the FedEx <laughs> guy, every time, I just look at him every time he brings me a package, and I'm like, bless you, my child. I know, <laughs> but it's a great theft deterrent, because they take one look down oh, that drive, man. and they're like, yeah, this ain't worth it, and we'll never get away, so... Yeah. It, uh, yeah, if you don't know when you're coming back, like if you don't know what you're coming back to, the driveway could look a little ominous. I'll just say that. That is true. And I love living out here, not only for that reason, but because I truly, I love people. But when I'm home, I love being home. Yeah. And it's a haven to me out here, surrounded by the trees. And yeah, we put up with outages quite a bit, but. I'm not willing to trade our little slice of heaven on earth here. So, Father God, thank you so much for giving us a little piece of real estate on this earth and allowing us to tend it and take care of it. And uh, we just appreciate the opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to take care of our little slice of earth. And sometimes that means outside of the home that we're living in. Sometimes it can be with the people that are around us or the people that are at our workplace, the people that are at the restaurant maybe, instill in us that desire to take care of what is being entrusted to us. And sometimes yes. that looks like land and sometimes it looks like people. Yes, yes. So Father God, we just thank you so much uh, for being there for us. Bless this reading today and we just look forward to digging into some more Leviticus and uh, 
opening our eyes to what it is you've got to teach us there. So I ask this all in your holy name. I pray. Amen. Amen. For anyone who happens to be out in this ice event too, I hope that you're safe wherever you are. Absolutely. So now, Heidi, you yes. are starting out today in Matthew. I am. We're going to read about a mere kernel of faith. And before you get started, I just wanted to yes. say, we met somebody at our church the other day, mm-hmm. believe me, and I just shared with her that we were doing this podcast. And Oh, yes. And she got excited. She's on the praise and worship team. If you're listening right now, what's up? Yeah, we love you. <laughs> But friends, we're just at this point growing the podcast. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate the comments, all of it. And if you've been blessed by any piece of this, it would mean the world to us if you were to share that with a friend and uh, and allow them to come on this journey with us. Yes, I am honored that anyone is choosing to use their time to listen, that it truly does mean a lot. We would do this regardless But we have some faithful people following, and that really, really does mean a lot to me. It's funny. I went back and I listened to (laughs) episode number one the other day, and it was just such a testament to when I started this. I had no idea about anything to do with podcasts. I had never done a podcast before. I just felt the call on my heart, and I felt God saying, be obedient, and I will teach you. And so I know everything that I do isn't perfect. And I know that there's other people that have maybe way more professional sounding this is or that's, but (laughs) I'm putting in the absolute best effort with everything I know Mm -hmm. I have at my disposal right now. And when I look back 42 episodes ago and I I look back at, I know. And so when I look back at episode number one and I listen to it, I just say, God, wow, you weren't kidding. Like. You have helped make things better and you did it along the way. Things didn't have to be perfect to Mm -hmm. get started. He just wanted me to be obedient and get started. Yes. And it, like, I think I'd mentioned this before. I love seeing you in here working on this and making it the very best that you can. And you're so diligent in learning and studying and researching because this is a labor of love and it's important to you. And I'm I'm honored that you want to do this with me. And so now Heidi will be starting out in Matthew. That's right. We're we're going to finish out chapter 17, starting at verse 14. At the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people. As they approached, a man came out of the crowd and fell to his knees, begging, Master, have mercy on my son. He goes out of his mind and suffers terribly, falling into seizures. Frequently he is pitched into the fire, other times into the river. I brought him to your disciples, but they could do nothing for him. Jesus said, What a generation! No sense of God! No focus to your lives! How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. He ordered the afflicting demon out, and it was out, gone. From that moment on, the boy was well. When the disciples had Jesus off to themselves, they asked, Why couldn't we throw it out? Because you're not yet taking God seriously, said Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's a. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, can you imagine being them? Like, mm. oh. because you're not taking God seriously. Ooh. I know. The simple truth is that if you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed, say, you would tell this mountain, move, and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. As they were regrouping in Galilee, Jesus told them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed to some people who want nothing to do with God. They will murder him, and three days later he will be raised alive. The disciples felt scared to death. When they arrived at Capernaum, the tax man came to Peter and asked, Does your teacher pay taxes? Peter said, Of course. But as soon as they were in the house, Jesus confronted him. Simon, what do you think? When a king levies taxes, who pays? His children 
or his subjects? He answered, his subjects. Jesus said, then the children get off free, right? But so we don't upset them needlessly. Go down to the lake, cast a hook, and pull in the first fish that bites. Open its mouth and you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to the tax men. It will be enough for both of us. I love how he always finds a way. I know, and it's never in that conventional way. I know. Why do you think he did it that way? Do you think there was additional symbolism behind the fish? He called them to be fishers of men, but mm. I also believe it's a test of faith. Do you believe me? Are you going to do this? Because it's going to be a it's a ridiculous ask. I was like, just going to use go, that word. Go ridiculous. Down. Yeah, it is. It's ridiculous. Go down, cast your uh, line in, grab the first fish, and then pull a coin out of its mouth. Exactly. Like, okay, God. Like, that happens can we get back the... to the normal miracles, I like fixing people's leprosy and stuff? Did everybody start fishing and checking <laughs> fish mouths and? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being a little kid on the beach and seeing that happen and being like, oh. That's where yeah, money comes from. Absolutely. I'm going after that. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm astonished again at how many demon-possessed people there mm. were. We've heard frequently so many of them. And the question is, is it because they knew Jesus was coming? Was there an increase? Is Was that always the norm? Was it extra activity? Just, I don't know what, was it, what that or was. Or was it mental illness? I don't know. What was going on? We're talking children, small, small children. And this child, it would literally, this child's body by the demon possession would throw itself into a fire, throw itself in the water and these parents are just frantically trying to save their child's life mm -hmm. I, it's just I found it really interesting because we've heard frequently about Jesus casting out the evil spirits so I'm not sure if is if there was more prevalent or it just displays or manifests differently yeah mm. I don't know or if Jesus death on the cross kind of changed some things I don't know there was definitely a stirring, mm -hmm. I, I would say. For sure. And um, and then again, he's still telling his disciples that you just don't get it yet. So. Yeah. And now I'll be picking up here in Acts, reading Acts 24. Paul states his defense. Within five days, the chief priest Ananias arrived with a contingent of leaders along with Tertullus, a trial lawyer. They presented the governor with their case against Paul. When Paul was called before the court, Tertullus called for the prosecution. Most honorable Felix, we are most grateful in all times and places for your wise and gentle rule. We are much aware that it is because of you and you alone that we enjoy all of this peace and gain daily profit from your reforms. I'm not going to tire you out with a long speech. I beg your kind indulgence in listening to me. I'll be quite brief. We found this man time and time again disturbing the peace, stirring up riots against Jews all over the world, the ringleader of a seditious act called the Nazarenes. He's a real bad apple, I must say. We caught him trying to defile our holy temple and arrested him. You'll be able to verify all of these accusations when you examine him yourself. The Jews joined in. Hear, hear, that's right. The governor motioned to Paul that it was now his turn. Paul said, I count myself fortunate to be defending myself before you, governor. Knowing how fair-minded that you've been in judging us all these years, I've been back in the country only 12 days. You can check out these dates easily enough. I came with the express purpose of worshiping in Jerusalem on Pentecost and I've been minding my own business the whole time. Nobody can say that they saw me arguing in the temple or working up a crowd in the streets. Not one of their charges can be backed up with evidence or witnesses. But I do freely admit this. In regard to the way which they malign as a dead-end street, I serve and worship the very same God served and worshipped by all of our ancestors, and embrace everything written in all of our scriptures. And I admit to living in hopeful anticipation that God will raise the dead, both the good and the bad, 
If that's my crime, my accusers are just as guilty as I am. Believe me, I do my level best to keep a clear conscience before God and my neighbors in everything that I do. I've been out of the country for a number of years, and now I'm back. While I was away, I took up a collection for the poor and brought that with me, along with offerings for the temple. It was while making those offerings that they found me quietly at my prayers in the temple. There was no crowd. There was no disturbance. It was some Jews from around Ephesus who started all of this trouble. And you'll notice that they're not even here today. They're cowards. Too cowardly to accuse me in front of you. So ask these others what crime they've caught me in. Don't let them hide behind this smooth-talking turtleus. The only thing they have on me is that one sentence I shouted out in the council. It's because I believe in the resurrection that I've been hauled into this court. Does that sound to you like grounds for a criminal case? Felix waffled. He knew far more about the way than he let on, and could have settled the case then and there. But uncertain of his best move politically, he played for time. When Captain Lysias comes down, I'll decide your case. He gave orders to the centurion to keep Paul in custody. But to more or less give him the run of the place and not prevent his friends from helping him. Sounds like a good prison sentence, yeah, actually. Yeah, if you need to be, you know, incarcerated, that would be the way I, mean, I would want to do it. Can I, I can I just kind of have the run of the place and can my friends come and go and help me with great. everything? My yeah. five years would have flown by. Oh, free housing and three I mean, squares and... <laughs> my whole plan on trying to make my time go by faster was sleeping more. Because I figured if I slept like 12 hours a day, that would turn a five-year sentence into like two and a half. I mean... (laughs) You were not made to be spending life in a small... Oh, no. ...enclosed place. Yeah. I had a lot of conversations with myself and God. Oh, man. (laughs) A few days later, Felix and his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish sent for Paul and listened to him talk about a life of believing in Jesus Christ. As Paul continued to insist on right relations with God and his people, about a life of moral discipline and the coming judgment, Felix felt things getting a little too close for comfort and dismissed him. That's enough for today. I'll call you back when it's convenient. At the same time, he was secretly hoping that Paul would offer him a substantial bribe. These conversations were repeated frequently. After two years of this, Felix was replaced by Portius Festus. Now there's a name. That is, I think you could pull that off. I kind of, I have felt like a Portius. Portius Festus. My name is Portius Festus. (laughs) Still playing up to the Jews and ignoring justice, Felix left Paul in prison. Mm. What bad Felix. Still with the run of the place and people coming and going and... I know. Well, at least he had the run of the place. And I think, think though, of how safe he was, though. It was the oh, safest place for him to be. And he could teach and instruct from there easily because they didn't stop people from coming. And look at what else God got him to do. He got him to sit down for a minute in a place where he could write, write. down and write and write and write. Because people would come to him and he'd send them with letters. Yes. Mm-hmm. I've written a lot of letters, but Paul, man... He wrote the most letters in the New Testament. Oh, yes. And just a profound writer and speaker. And like I said, man, he was all in no matter what he did. When he's filled with the Holy Spirit, it's bold and Mm -hmm. yes. (laughs) Absolutely. And so now everybody's favorite part, we are rewinding back to the Old Testament. And Heidi will be picking up here in Psalms. We are on... The uh, the Kleenexes are on the third square from the left. <laughs> square number. No. I've been doing pretty good. I get very yeah, closer ben. emotional, and I don't mind it when those moments come. I love it when God hits me right smack in the feels. Like, oh, it's like, God, you put this right here mm-hmm. for me right now. Now, you're talking to me and telling me, I'm right here, girl, I got you. And not only is God speaking to Heidi when she's reading these, 
I want you to really take a moment and listen to Heidi while she's speaking these words. Just pause everything that you're doing. If you're driving, pull over. If you're at your house, turn everything else off. But just listen to this psalm for today and mm. listen to Heidi. I don't even know what's in the psalm, but I, I just feel like somebody yeah. needs to pause what they're doing mm-hmm. and there's going to be something in it for somebody. So take it away. There is. All right. We are reading Psalm 39. I'm determined to watch steps and tongues so they won't land me in trouble. I decided to hold my tongue as long as the wicked is in the room. Mum's the word, I said, and kept quiet. But the longer I kept silence, the worse it got. My insides got hotter and hotter. My thoughts boiled over. I spilled my guts. Tell me what's going on, God. How long do I have to live? Give me the bad news. You've kept me on pretty short rations. My life is a string too short to be saved. Oh, we're all puffs of air. Oh, we're all shadows in a campfire. Oh, we're just spit in the wind. We make our pile and then we leave it. What am I doing in the meantime, Lord? Hoping. Hmm. That's what I'm doing. Hmm. Hoping. You'll save me from a rebel life. Save me from the contempt of idiots. I'll say no more. I'll shut my mouth since you, Lord, are behind all this. But I can't take it much longer. When you put us through the fire to purge us from our sin, our dearest idols go up in smoke. Are we also nothing but smoke? Ah, God, listen to my prayer, my cry. Open your ears. Don't be callous. Just look at these tears of mine. I'm a stranger here. I don't know my way. A migrant like my whole family. Give me a break. Cut me some slack before it's too late and I'm out of here. I love David's writing. Mm. I love how this started. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to sit here. It gets worse and worse and worse. And then right in the middle, what am I doing? I'm hoping... Hoping, and that's what it comes down yes. to. That's a, I think we overlook what a gift hope is, yeah. and that is of God. And we've talked before about that silence in those times you're feeling so alone. Yeah, you're not. God is right there in it. Just turn around and walk closer to Him. Hang on to hope, even if that's what you feel is all you have left. Hang on to it tooth and nail. That is a gift from God. And I promise you that hope will pay off because God has never failed. And that's ever. part of the beauty of the Bible is that it is that message of hope. It is. And it's also part of what we do here with Set Free mm. with giving people some hope mm-hmm. that are going through some stuff. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest reason why we shared little snippets of our story as yeah. we go along. Not that we're trying to self-promote or anything mm. like that. It's just we Nothing know we've been there. We've done that. We don't have it all figured out. But we have figured out that there's one reason for our joy. Mm. And there's one reason <laughs> for our hope. And we love sharing that with yes. people. Because it caused profound changes for both of us. Both of us. Absolutely. Um, We know the value of having that person that believes in you. We know the value of hearing a story that inspires just that thought that, you know what, maybe I can make it. Yeah. If we had not turned around and took those steps towards God, I don't believe you or I would be sitting here today. I don't believe so either. Yeah. Yeah, it's God changes lives that profoundly. And we share and talk about that because we are living examples of it. Yes. And if you need hope, I think if you knew the combination of stories between (laughs) the two of us, because we have gone through some stuff, I think you would understand just how much hope we represent because... I'm sure a lot of people thought we were pretty hopeless for a long time. And that's the beauty of the journey through the message, right? We are going through the Bible and talking about the hope there. 
-hmm. and then also highlighting the hope that it's given us yes and this the is journey a, we've been on it's not just stories to read about other people no these are here so you can know and believe this is for you also and now I'll be ending the day in Leviticus, and we are at Leviticus chapter 5, 6, and 7. We are going to get some instruction today. Get ready. <laughs> wonder, is there any songs in store, or was that a one and done in Exodus? It's not a one and done, uh, but it is definitely impromptu. <laughs> You can't, okay. you can't command a song out of me. Oh, that's how it's going to work. <laughs> it so. has to well up naturally. Oh, from the Spirit. That's right, from the Spirit. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't that amazing in church yesterday, speaking of the we, Spirit? We had another good church day. Ooh. If, I'm just going to throw this out here. If you're, I don't know what kind of church you go to, if, if you're even part of a church. If you're not, I would suggest... Just go out church shopping or whatever you want visit. to call it. You know, just visit some churches. We had some guests at our church uh, this last Sunday, and uh, we had just talked to them for a little bit, and they were just bouncing. They love seeing the local churches in the area. Yes. What I love that they said, they love to visit different churches because they love to see where Jesus is in the communities. Mm. And I thought that was amazing. And they were a very interesting couple. I yeah. loved that we had the opportunity to have a few minutes with him. Yep. And just beautiful interactions that he had with my grandson, <laughs> Levi. It was heartwarming and a great moment. So now I'll be picking up in Leviticus 5. If you sin by not stepping up and offering yourself as a witness to something that you've heard or seen in cases of wrongdoing, you'll be held responsible. Or, if you touch anything ritually unclean, like the carcass of an unclean animal, wild or domestic, or a dead reptile, and you weren't aware of it at the time, but you're contaminated and you're guilty— or if you touch human uncleanness, any sort of ritually contaminating uncleanness, and you're not aware of it at the time, but later you realize it and you're guilty. Or if you impulsively swear to do something, whether good or bad, some rash oath that just pops out, and you aren't aware of what you've done at the time, but later you come to realize it and you're guilty in any of these cases, when you are guilty immediately confess the sin that you've committed and bring as your penalty to God for the sin that you have committed a female lamb or goat from the flock for an absolution offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for your sin. If you can't afford a lamb, bring as your penalty to God for the sin that you have committed two doves or two pigeons, one for the absolution offering and the other for the whole burnt offering. Bring them to the priest who will first offer the one for the absolution offering. He'll wring its neck but not sever it, splash some of the blood on the absolution offering against the altar, and then squeeze the rest of it out at the base. It's an absolution offering. He'll then take the second bird and offer it as a whole burnt offering following the procedures step by step. Man, they weren't playing with these birds. No, no, I, mean, I know. I've held a bird in my hand before, and like, I just, I mean, wringing a bird's neck, that just does not sound. It goes against your <laughs> nature, but it's supposed to, because right. even God commands, but I think that was part of it. He needs people to understand the ramification of their sin. Something yeah. else has to pay for something they did. And as humans, that should sit hard on you. I wonder if they named their animals back in the day. Oh, don't say. See, it's hard enough for me to read about this because <laughs> I love all animals. And I'm like, oh, I oh, I wouldn't have done well. I'd do my best, God, but oh, I'd struggle. In this way, the priest will make atonement for your sin and you're forgiven. If you can't afford the two doves or pigeons, bring two quarts of fine flour for your absolution offering. Don't put oil or incense on it. It's an absolution offering. Bring it to the priest, and he'll take a handful from it as a memorial and burn it on the altar with the gifts for God. It's an absolution offering. The priest will make atonement for you and any of these sins that you've committed, and you're forgiven. The rest of the offering belongs to the priest. The same as with the grain offering. God spoke to Moses. 
When a person betrays his trust and unknowingly sins by straying against any of the holy things of God, he is to bring as his penalty to God a ram without any defect from the flock. The value of the ram assessed in shekels according to the sanctuary shekel for a compensation offering. He is to make additional compensation for the sin that he has committed against any holy thing by adding 20% to the ram and giving it to the priest. Thus the priest will make atonement for him with the ram of compensation offering, that, and he is forgiven. If anyone sins by breaking any of the commandments of God which must not be broken, but without being aware of it at the time, the moment that he does realize his guilt, he is held responsible. He is to bring to the priest a ram without any defect, assessed at the value of the compensation offering. Thus the priest will make atonement for him for his error that he was unaware of, and he is forgiven. It is a compensation offering. He was surely guilty before God. God spoke to Moses. When anyone sins by betraying trust with God by deceiving his neighbor regarding something entrusted to him, or by robbing or cheating or threatening him, or if he has found something lost and lies about it and swears falsely regarding any of these sins that the people commonly commit, when he sins and is found guilty, he must return what he stole or extorted, restore what was entrusted to him, return the lost thing he found, or anything else about which he swore falsely. He must make full compensation, add 20% to it, and hand it over to the owner on the same day that he brings his compensation offering. He must present to God as his compensation offering a ram without any defect from the flock, assessed at the value of a compensation offering. Thus the priest will make atonement for him before God, and he's forgiven of any of the things that one does that brings guilt. God spoke to Moses. Command Aaron and his sons. Tell them, these are the instructions for the whole burnt offering. Leave the whole burnt offering on the altar hearth through the night until morning, with the fire kept burning on the altar. Then dress in your fine linen clothes with linen underwear next to your body. Remove the ashes remaining from the whole burnt offering and place them besides the altar. Then change clothes and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Meanwhile, keep the fire on the altar burning. It must not go out. Replenish the wood for the fire every morning. Arrange the whole burnt offering on it and burn the fat of the peace offering on top of it all. Keep the fire burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. These are the instructions for the grain offering. Aaron's sons are to present it to God in front of the altar. The priest takes a handful of fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and all of its incense and burns this as a memorial on the altar, a pleasing fragrance to God. Aaron and his sons eat the rest of it. It is unraised bread and so eaten in a holy place, in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. They must not bake it with yeast. I have designated it as their share of the gifts presented to me. It is very holy, like the absolution offering and the compensation offering. Any male descendant among Aaron's sons may eat it. This is a fixed rule regarding God's gifts, stretching down through the generations. Anyone who touches these offerings must be holy. God spoke to Moses. This is the offering which Aaron and his sons are to present to God on the day that he is anointed. Two quarts of fine flour as a regular grain offering, half in the morning and half in the evening. Prepare it with oil on a griddle. Bring it well mixed and then present it crumbled in pieces as a pleasing fragrance to God. Aaron's son, who is anointed to succeed him, offers it to God. This is a fixed rule. The whole thing is burned. Every grain offering of a priest is burned completely. It must not be eaten. God spoke to Moses. Tell Aaron and his sons. These are the instructions for the absolution offering. Slaughter the absolution offering in the place where the whole burnt offering is slaughtered before God. The offering is most holy. The priest in charge eats it in a holy place. The courtyard of the tent of meeting. 
Anyone who touches any of the meat must be holy. A garment that gets blood splattered on it must be washed in a holy place and with bleach. That's what it said? Oh, no, it doesn't say bleach, but oh. I'm just saying, like, I mean, they I'm should like, have that in there. What is Old Testament bleach, well, may I ask? Uh, Leviticus 6 is sponsored by Clorox. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have a clean altar. Break the clay pot in which the meat was cooked. If it was cooked in a bronze pot, scour it and rinse it with water. See what I'm saying? Isn't there about some cleanliness here? Well, yes, they always were. No, I'm just saying Clorox could get in on this. Any male among the priestly families may eat it. It is most holy. But any absolution offering whose blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the sanctuary must not be eaten. It has to be burned. Chapter 7. These are the instructions for the compensation offering. It is most holy. Slaughter the compensation offering in the same place that the whole burnt offering is slaughtered. Splash its blood against all sides of the altar. Offer up all the fat. The fat tail, the fat covering the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat encasing them at the loins, and the lobe of the liver that is removed with the kidneys. The priest burns them on the altar as a gift to God. It is a compensation offering. Any male from among the priest's families may eat it, but it must be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. The compensation offering is the same as the absolution offering. The same rules apply to both. The offering belongs to the priest who makes atonement with it. The priest who presents a whole burnt offering for someone gets the hide for himself. Every grain offering baked in an oven or prepared in a pan or on a griddle belongs to the priest who presents it. It's his. Every grain offering, whether dry or mixed with oil, belongs equally to all the sons of Aaron. These are the instructions for the peace offering which is presented to God. If you bring it to offer thanksgiving, then along with the thanksgiving offering, present unraised loaves of bread mixed with oil, unraised wafers spread with oil, and cakes of fine flour, well kneaded and mixed with oil. Along with the peace offering of thanksgiving, present loaves of yeast bread as an offering. Bring one of each kind as an offering, a contribution offering to God. It goes to the priest who throws the blood of the peace offering. Eat the meat from the peace offering of thanksgiving the same day that it's offered. Don't leave any of it overnight. Might get flies on it. <laughs> if the offering is a votive offering or a free will offering, it may be eaten the same day that it's sacrificed, and whatever is left over on the next day may also be eaten. But any meat from the sacrifice that is left to the third day must be burned up. If any of the meat from the peace offering is eaten on the third day, the person who has brought it will not be accepted. It won't benefit him a bit. It has become defiled meat, and whoever eats it must take responsibility for his iniquity. And whoever eats it must take responsibility for his iniquity. Don't eat meat that has touched anything ritually unclean. Burn it up. Any other meat can be eaten by those who are ritually clean. But if you're not ritually clean and eat meat from the peace offering for God, you will be excluded from the congregation. And if you touch anything ritually unclean, whether human or animal uncleanness, or an obscene object, I wonder what those were. <laughs> I'm curious now. I mean, it's just as an obscene object. I live by the rule, don't ask questions don't you ask. don't want yeah. the answers to. I don't to. want to know what an obscene object is. <laughs> okay, thank you. Away from me, devil. And go ahead and eat from a peace offering for God. You'll be excluded from the congregation. God spoke to Moses. Speak to the people of Israel. Tell them, don't eat any fat of cattle or sheep or goats. The fat of an animal found dead or torn by wild animals can be put to some other purpose. But you may not eat it. If you eat fat from an animal which a gift has been presented to God, you'll be excluded from the congregation. And don't eat blood, whether of birds or animals, no matter where you end up living. If you eat blood, you'll be excluded from the congregation. God spoke to Moses. Speak to the people of Israel. 
Tell them, when you present a peace offering to God, bring some of your peace offering as a special sacrifice to God, a gift to God in your own hands. Bring the fat with the breast and then wave the breast before God as a wave offering. The priest will burn the fat on the altar. Aaron and his sons get the breast. Give the right thigh from your peace offering as a contribution offering to the priest. Give a portion of the right thigh to the son of Aaron who offers the blood and fat of the peace offering as his portion. From the peace offerings of Israel, I'm giving the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the contribution offering to Aaron the priest and his sons. This is their fixed compensation from the people of Israel. From the day that they are presented to serve as priests to God, Aaron and his sons can expect to receive these allotments from the gifts of God. This is what God commanded the people of Israel to give the priests from the day of their anointing. This is the fixed rule down through the generations. These are the instructions for the whole burnt offering, the grain offering, the absolution offering, the compensation offering, the ordination offering, and the peace offering which God gave Moses at Mount Sinai on the day that he commanded the people of Israel to present their offerings to God in the wilderness of Sinai. Mm. And that reminder, they're literally not in a home. They're wandering in the desert. And God is establishing there these rules and laws for them to follow to point them towards Jesus and that sacrifice. And remember, like they're getting ready to go into a culture that is so outside of what God Mm -hmm. wants them to be. Yes. And he really just wants them to get entrenched in like, this is me. You can look to me. You can trust me. You can, you know, uh, and this is how you get to me. This is how, when you feel far away from me, this is how you Mm -hmm. come back close again. Absolutely. And God let them go 40 years in that desert. They had to be far, far, far from Mm -hmm. the ways of Mm -hmm. Egypt, but prepared for this land that they're going into because there's gods of all kinds and they're in so many their laws are contrary to anything that god wants for his people it's almost like taking somebody from an aboriginal tribe Mm -hmm. and then taking them out of that element and bringing them now into let's say america Mm -hmm. think about culture shock think about all of the quote-unquote gods that we have here with social media with drug yes. addiction with uh just all, so just many so they, many things and materialism they're so appealing. Uh, just all of this yes. stuff and like the houses the cars the and you want the it shopping malls i the, want it all i, I need want to it keep all. up like, with the joneses yeah, it's time to sell the house because we need a bigger one yeah there's only two of us but now we've got five bedrooms and two bathrooms and we've got this we and i'm like we're everybody it's so normal it's and i'm saying this about myself too i catch Mm -hmm. myself at times it's so normalized to think we need more better bigger stuff just stuff yeah i am almost sickened by the number of storage shed facilities storage units how many there are that literally is just saying We have too much stuff. For the amount of money I think that some people pay for storage units, like you could literally buy a shed and put it at your house. I mean. (laughs) You don't. But the point is, is you don't need so much. And that's why I'm like, I do believe that part of the reason it's hard to be a true good Christian in the aspect that Jesus wants it to be and tells us it needs to be like. Because of our wealth, because Mm -hmm. we don't have to rely on God for survival. Mm -hmm. We've got more than enough food to last us how long? We often will say, there's nothing to eat. And other people would be like, there's enough for our family to eat for a month in your house. It's just nothing you want to eat right now. Exactly. (laughs) I know. It's... It's convicting to me. And I think that's also part of as you age, 
your priorities take drastic shifts and changes and mm. things that seem to matter so much before. I'm telling you right now, they don't mean nothing to me. I am so unimpressed with wealth, mm. with designer brands, expensive purses, sports cars. Unimpressed. It doesn't impress me. Good for you. There's nothing wrong with enjoying something that you have. I just have zero. I'm like, Meh. a purse is a purse. It just has to carry your stuff. If you like it and it's cute, all I need to know. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. And friends, that's part of the journey that we're on just through mm -hmm. life, right? We uh, journey through life changing and evolving yes. and things that were important 20 years ago aren't so important anymore. The biggest difference, I've drawn close to God and I've drawn close to Jesus. And a lot of the things that I thought I needed for happiness or to be seen as successful don't mean that to mm. me anymore. And I feel like I have everything that I need. And I feel more successful now in the little that I have than I ever have at any other time in life because it's God-driven. So friends, take a pause here real quick and just look back at your life. Mm -hmm. Look back five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. How have you evolved? How have things changed in your life? Are there things that maybe you thought one way about 20 years ago that maybe mm -hmm. you think completely different now? And why is that? I've found for mm -hmm. myself it, that a lot of times the reason I changed my mind is because of people. The people you surround yourself mm -hmm. with influence your thinking and your thoughts. So I'm realizing truly how vitally important it is to surround yourself with people who are helping you go the direction you're trying mm -hmm. to go in. Human beings, man, we are so easily <laughs> swayed and manipulated by those yeah. little shiny little things that yeah. look so great and so fun. And I, I don't want to deviate from this path that yeah. I'm on with you. And we really have some great people in our life that are all rowing their boats in the same direction. And it makes a tremendous difference. So we would be curious if you've had some personal changes in your mm -hmm. life, whether it was a year ago, five years, 10 or 20. Yeah. How have you grown? How have you grown since God's been introduced back in your life? Mm -hmm. If God is a part of your life, how have you grown since that has happened? So we're always down for a little bit more conversation. Yes. And if you want to join the conversation after the podcast, jump over to the Facebook group. Just look for Journey Through the Message. Uh, if you can't find that, just look for Heidi or I. We're not hard to find. We're out there. We're not hiding. And for those of you that are really questioning your faith or your belief in God, is he real? Where is he? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, for me personally, I would love to hear from you. Absolutely. I would love to talk with you. This is a safe place to explore those mm -hmm. questions. If you come with a question about God and is he real? We're not going to shut you down or think that you're, we're just going to start that journey exactly right where you're at. Absolutely. It's not and up to us to try and clean you up. God will take care of that. Some of my favorite people are the ones in the desert. Those, I am so drawn to them. And I think it's just my excitement. It's like I've entered my Canaan, so to speak. <laughs> And I look back and I see people, they're heading this direction and I know they're going to get here. Mm -hmm. I know they are, but they're out there and they're hungry and they're thirsty. They just need somebody to walk out there and bring them the sustenance and the nourishment to just keep going forward. I can't fix it for you. I can't change your journey for mm -hmm. you. God has that planned out, but I can promise you, God has so many people that want so badly to walk with you through it because they've been there. And friends, if you're there right now, we're here to journey with you and we appreciate you following along on the journey through the message. We sure do. And we can't wait to be back with you for the next episode. We'll see you soon.